wake up at a quarter of five in the a.m. every morning. That's about 12 hours before most niggas wake up. <laughs> I am a very spiritual person. I start each day by thanking a white man for the sunrise, for the land I walk on, for the air I breathe. I also apologize for niggas, but Lord knows they ain't gonna apologize for themselves. I am not black, nor do I consider myself to be black. Many people mistake me for being Negro because they don't know that I am currently living with the heartbreak of revitiligo. That's a skin condition that's the opposite of what Michael Jackson's got. Every morning I apply this topical ointment made of bleach and sulfur. I like to think it works. Luckily, I hadn't gotten much darker in the last few years. As you can see here, I enjoy building small shrines to certain special white people who are important in my life. This one here is dedicated to John Wayne. Great white man. Didn't take no shit from niggers, Indians, nor Mexicans. And this one here is for George Bush the first. Loved him. Now this one here is dedicated to the most soul for soul singer to ever live. Yeah, I work about 32 jobs over the course of a week. I think it's interesting I got 32 jobs and most niggers say they can't find one. <laughs> niggers. Context of white supremacy. Justice Gusty Renegade in for another program, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy racism. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into the program. I hope it is a constructive investment of your Wednesday evening. Uh, today's date, Wednesday, October 19th. 2011 uh, program opened that is uh, Uncle Ruckus the Boondocks uh, that specific episode uh, the Uncle Ruckus reality show where he gets a whole program to broadcast his anti-black views uh, and how much he wishes he was white I thought that would be a great lead for today's broadcast I think it uh, is right on point with what our guest today uh, is going to be talking about excellent information and this was a suggestion uh, from 404, longtime listener and investor in Atlanta. Great suggestion. I think you all will really appreciate our guest's information. Uh, he's written several books uh, on the topic of skin discrimination, skin color discrimination. Uh, one of his books, Bleaching Beauty, Light Skin as a Filipina Ideal. Uh, he's also the author of Racism in the 21st Century. An Empirical Analysis of Skin Color. Uh, the book we're going to look at today, uh, published in 2010, An Historical Analysis of Skin Color Discrimination in America, Victimism Among Victim Group Populations. And I think you'll get a great understanding of Uncle Ruckus's behavior in the clip that you just heard. Uh, our guest, he is a professor of African American and African Studies at Michigan State University and considered one of the leading scholars in the world on skin color discrimination. Real pleasure to have him on the program. Uh, joining us live, Dr. Ronald Hall. Uh, Dr. Hall, are you with us? Pleased to be here. Outstanding. The pleasure is ours, Dr. Hall. Uh, thank you so much for sharing some of your uh, Wednesday evening. I know you're super busy and uh, we are grateful that you could share some of your time and expertise with us. Um, More than welcome. I guess for, for folks who might not have read some of your material, this might be their first time hearing from you. Uh, if you could just give us some background information to let us know a little bit more about the work that you do, that would be outstanding. Well, I've been engaging in uh, discourse on the issue of skin color, I guess, for about 15 or 20 years now. Uh, one of the things that I noticed growing up in the 60s was the fact that most of uh, the information we get, class content, seems to be very Eurocentric, um, very Eurocentric perspective. And there's a reality that exists that really doesn't get much coverage, uh, particularly as it pertains to uh, people of color and persons of African descent. And I had realized growing up in the 60s that the issue of race was uh, very prominent and what I refer to as the black-white dichotomy was usually what we uh, heard about when the issue of race came up. But I realized also that African Americans and other people of color have been socialized in the same racist environment that other groups have experienced, 
and therefore we tended to, in many instances, uh, express the same kinds of behaviors uh, interracially and intraracially. And the interracial forms of discrimination is the Eurocentric perspective and the intraracial forms of discrimination based on skin color gets uh, pretty much ignored. And uh, that became the focus of my dissertation, uh, which I finished in 1989. And subsequently, in 1990, I was uh, contacted by an attorney in Atlanta, Georgia, to testify as an expert witness in the nation's first skin color discrimination case involving African Americans, which we all know about, but it's, it's a taboo subject. It was uh, Marvel versus the Internal Revenue Service, in which a lighter-skinned African American female sued her darker-skinned African American supervisor who worked at the Internal Revenue Service on the basis of skin color discrimination. And, and prior to that, um, I had been highly criticized about something that was simply non-existent, when in fact it was just such a taboo subject that African Americans didn't want to talk about it and have it viewed in public. But when the court case came out, then that sort of, uh, that sort of resolved a lot of the issues as to whether or not it's in fact a reality. Uh, that was the first case involving African Americans, and since then, I keep abreast of the literature. There have literally been hundreds of cases filed on the basis of skin color discrimination, not only by persons of African descent, but persons of Latino descent as well. In fact, my familiarity with the literature, I know that the first case of skin color discrimination did not involve African Americans, but in fact was a case called Felix versus Manquez, uh, and that took place between uh, Puerto Ricans living in the uh, city of Washington, D.C. back in 1980. So that was a full 10 years before the first case involving African Americans took place. But again, because of the Eurocentric influence in academia, a lot of the reality that's pertaining to people of color simply, uh, are simply trivialized. And so I've been working on this issue uh, since 1990, uh, and unfortunately in 19, I'm sorry, in 2008, I conferred with a case in Atlanta, Georgia, where an African-American woman was married to an Indian-Asian husband, and the father of the husband did not approve of the marriage because the woman being African-American and also being darker-skinned, uh, he had her murdered. And the case got a lot of national attention, but still the issue of skin color discrimination as it impacts African-Americans and people of color has simply not gotten the kind of attention uh, that I think it deserves and I think it merits. Excellent start for the program, I think. Um, I guess before, and you cover that, uh, the last court case where the black female, she was married to a non-black, non-white person, and her parents, or excuse me, his parents didn't approve, and ultimately she was murdered. Uh, that's covered in your book that we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to, I guess before we uh, start the program off, you are a black male, correct? Through African-American descent, yes. Yes, okay. Um, this program, the COWS uh, acronym, Context of White Supremacy, uh, I think I assert and I think you agree in your book that what is producing this behavior is racism, white supremacy. Um, the definition that I use for both racism and white supremacy, I use those two terms as synonyms. Uh, the definition that, that I use is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you believe that such a system exists and do you think that's an accurate definition? Uh, I think that that may have been uh, a reality during the height of colonialism. I think that has evolved today because you know we have an African-American president, and he's not president because uh, African-Americans voted him in. It's a significant portion uh, of, of white Americans who have supported our president. But one of the things that I see that's new, you have a number of African-Americans and per other persons of color who share the same sentiments as colonials did 
four or five hundred years ago. And that's what makes a difference. It started out uh, as an issue of white supremacy vis-a-vis -vis colonialism. And it kind of has evolved to something that's a little more sophisticated and I think uh, a little more um, uh, difficult to grasp because of that. It's not, we know in the 60s, we had people under sheets and, and people who were overtly racist. Well, today in the year 2011, it's, it's not very easy to grasp that element. They're still there and they're still operating, but they're not as obvious. And I guess that's what makes them more, much more formidable because you, you're not always certain as to who and what you're dealing with. I, I would totally agree. I think the, the system has certainly uh, refined itself. Um, over the is, is constantly evolving and refining itself, and uh, I think one of the ways that you talk about in your book um, the current manifestation of that system, which I assert still exists, white supremacy, is that tons of non-white people, perhaps all non-white people, have been infected with that racist yes. mindset and yes. take those pathologies and we just victimize other non-white people, which helps keep that system in check, even when white people aren't necessarily the ones who are doing the direct abuse. Yes. Oh. And that's what makes it so difficult uh, in the year 2000 uh, to, to get a grasp, uh, you know, the current Republican nominee that's running for uh, presidential nomination for the Republican Party. I mean, I think he's a primary example. And uh, I, I don't understand it because he was educated, I understand, from the news media at uh, Morehouse College, which is an HBCU. So certainly um, he's someone that evolved in the black community, and you expect that he would be more um, representative of our community politically. But um, that doesn't seem to be the case. Mm, wow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think hopefully listeners, they'll get a better understanding of this as we move along through the broadcast. Um, your your 2010 publication, uh, the term victimism, uh, I think is yes. real important. I was hoping you could kind of break that down for our listeners so they understand what you mean when you say victimism. Well, originally I wanted the title of the book to be victimism. And uh, my publisher indicated that when people go to uh, the library, that's not a term that they would enter in a search database because it's, it's really a term that I, I coined myself. So it had to be part of the subtitle. But what I refer to when I talk about victimism, it's, a, it's an ism. It's an ism similar to racism, sexism, um, classism, etc. But it is a type of racism that is exercised by people who are normally the victims of racism. So normally African Americans and Latinos, uh, to some extent Asians, have been victimized by various forms of discrimination. But instead of fighting to end discrimination, uh, some will engage in activities that you would expect to find a racist person engaging in. And to some extent, uh, I think they can go places and do things because they may be accepted or more tolerated by those otherwise overtly racist elements because they take racist views of uh, people of color, even though they are people of color themselves. So it's, it's an issue of self-interest. Uh, if those who are victims engage in victimism, then sometimes there can be some personal gains uh, for them, uh, for themselves. Uh, this man by the name of Mr. Ward uh, from California, uh, he's advocating that we should do away at what well, he was part of the movement, the anti-affirmative action movement in California, advocating that they do away with um, admissions criteria specifically aimed at facilitating admissions of African Americans and Latinos. Uh, Ward Connolly led that, was part of that movement. So you have persons like him uh, who otherwise would be victims of that kind of discrimination engage in such discrimination themselves and, and support it. Mm. Uh, big byproduct uh, of the system of white supremacy. Um, I just I wanted you to make sure our listeners they understand the consequences that this has because I think that's a big uh, part of your book and saying that this this is something that really has to be addressed as a major issue uh, and it's getting worse um, in my opinion. Um, sure. And 
I think the consequences, especially, and this you talk about in your book, this impacts all non-white people, but especially black people and darker people, how this plays out when other non-white people end up functioning just like racists and mistreating other non-white people. Yes. I guess, or I guess. I'm well, sorry. There's a, sort of, there's a sort of unwritten hierarchy that exists throughout the world, and uh, no one speaks of it directly, but you have a rank ordering of people with persons of Caucasian descent at the very top, and then you can rank order people, all people below that rank, based on their skin color. So Asian persons, if they're lighter skin, are going to rank higher than a Latino person if that Latino person is darker skin. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Hall, are you still with us? Yes, sir. Yes, oh, sir. Okay, just making sure we didn't lose you. Wow. And I guess I would say I was going to touch on this later, but I think uh, with regards to immigrants, or I think just non-white people in general, it doesn't necessarily have to be immigrants. It can even be other black people. Uh, One of the ways, and I think this has been long running, one of the ways that non-white people have been able to earn favor, uh, get better treatment, uh, move up the social ladder, uh, gaining favor with white people, is to show their disdain for other non-white people, especially black people, darker non-white people. Exactly. Exactly. That's during the antebellum period, (laughs) that was the notion of the field Negro and the house Negro. And as Malcolm said in his book, uh, in his autobiography, when the master's house caught on fire or when the master got sick, the field Negro would say, the house Negro would say, uh, Master, we sick, or Master, our house is burning down. But the uh, field Negro took a totally different perspective on that because he lived a different life. Uh, He had a different reality. But the house Negro, as much as he could, facilitated the lifestyle of the master because it created a situation where he could live a slightly better life than his uh, field Negro counterpart. And you see that happening today. It's, it's happening today with this new emerging uh, black conservative movement. And some of those the black conservatives today are more pointed and more critical of uh, black people than, than a lot of whites are. And they've, they've internalized these uh, racist norms, um, and it's it's devastating uh, the black community. Wow. <sighs> Again, our guest, Dr. Ronald Hall, uh, as you were sharing that, I was reminded, I'm forgetting the name of the film. I'll find it uh, before the program ends, but it's about uh, the abuse that Native Americans have suffered, and there's a line where a non uh, non-white character, he's Native American male, and he says, uh, I'm going to out-white the white man. He uh, uh, he actually is catching Native Americans who've escaped from some of the schools yeah. that they've been sent to. That's his job. He goes out and he catches these yeah. children and brings them back for white people. And I think that's yeah. another example of exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think a part of this process, actually, in my opinion, I think a big part of this pro- uh, process is the way that words are used. Um, I think we touch on this program a lot, the importance of words and and the huge, just astronomical impact that words have on how we think, the way we perceive of the world, how we function, Uh, just some of the terms. uh, This is uh, in in your book on page uh, 61, and you're talking about Asian languages, when you write that in many Asian languages, the words fair and beautiful are often used synonymously, uh, which I didn't know that, but that, I mean, I shouldn't have been surprised <laughs> given the conditions. Uh, and then I'm skipping ahead a little bit. This is on page 64. Uh, you write, <clears throat> you're talking about a, a non-white Pakistani female. Uh, and she, a uh, well-educated 23-year-old named Nasim Jamil. She's young and attractive, but not at all satisfied with the way she looks. I am not fair enough, she commented to a local news organization. And I just, those terms using fair, which in English, a synonym not just for beauty, but for justice, for white, having that term be associated with beauty and justice and reasonableness, huge impact on the way we think, and I think is a major contributor to that victimism that you talk about. Do do you think that makes sense? Yes. Uh, And this 
uh, individual, I think that, that part of the book you're referring to, either a person of Indian descent or Pakistani descent, but, well, India and Pakistan is just a political separation, but uh, they were influenced by uh, Eurocentric uh, influences, the Eurocentric factions. Most people are aware that India was uh, colonized by the British, who left in about 1949, but what most people don't know is the fact that uh, India had been invaded by Aryans back uh, in 1500 B.C., and Aryans I take to be persons of Caucasian descent. And they had actually entered India, conquered India, and meld or gelled with the population. So those Indians who live in the northern area of India are lighter skinned or fairer skinned. And those who live in the other areas, the southern areas, are darker complected. In fact, many Indian Asians are much darker complected than uh, African Americans and persons of African descent in Africa. But they idealize light skin. So any, when they come to America, many instances, they will have a lot of difficulty relating to black people. They will have a lot of difficulty respecting black people just based purely on their skin color. And they rank people by the amount of Caucasian blood or light skin that they have. So the person who had his daughter-in-law murdered in Atlanta, I'm not at all surprised. And I've, I've corresponded with Indians from India, and it's the darker skin, the darker complected Indians who complain to me the sufferings that they experience by their Indian counterparts because they're darker complected. And many of them are untouchables who are, are treated as, as bad as Native Americans have been treated in this country. But they've been subjected to uh, those colonial Eurocentric influences, which results in what I refer to as uh, victimism. And this is cultural for them. It, it's something that they've internalized. It's been going on for generations. And when something like that is, has that kind of longevity, you can't, you can't uh, end it overnight. So it's a problem in relating to, to people of color when they arrive here. Um, uh, <clears throat> I believe uh, my co-host, Justice, I think she's also with us, and uh, she might have some questions as well. Justice, if you have some questions for Dr. Hall, your line should be open. Proceed. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, greetings, uh, Dr. Hall. Greetings. Um, I know that a lot of non-white people uh, are confused about racism, white supremacy. Uh, I was just curious, how did you get informed about racism, white supremacy? Well, uh, first of all, I was born and raised in the U.S., and that's one of the first uh, issues, I think, as a person of African descent that you're confronted with. And early on, I didn't, I didn't realize that there was any real difference until I, I grew up in a normal in an African-American, predominantly black neighborhood uh, in West Philadelphia. And it was when I began to venture out that I noticed I got treated a little differently. Uh, at first, it was just something that uh, I thought was just all a figment of my imagination. But I would go into stores, and I would, I would get followed, and I realized that that became a pattern, uh, as if I were going to steal something. And then, of course, eventually I had some confrontations with the police, which uh, were frequently unnecessary. If, if I was in the wrong neighborhood or if I was someplace that not many blacks went, then that was reason enough for me to be stopped by the police. And I began to see a pattern. And then I began to recognize, recognize myself as not just uh, a person, but I had to recognize myself as a black person because that made a difference in how society was going to react to me and to deal with me. And if I didn't, if I didn't recognize that, then I could put myself in, uh, in, in jeopardy in many instances. When did you start talking to non-white people about racism, white supremacy? Oh, I guess I started. Actually, it was never something that I intentionally intended to do. I, I began writing about it. And once I began writing about it, I started getting calls and, and questions from people. But I guess I've been doing this for about a good 15, 20 years. And I do more research than I do talking because it's it's a... Doing the writing is a is a 24/7 job, and once the literature gets out there, I frequently get calls and um, 
uh, invites to do these kinds of interviews, and I, I share my views and my perspective. Right currently, I'm I'm on a, um, I'm working for an attorney in the area, and I, I do a lot of consulting work. I'm working for an attorney on a discrimination case, and if I've seen one, I've seen them all. It, it's the black man gets into a confrontation with the police. Someone claims that they saw a weapon. Of course, there's never a weapon. So what's going to happen is we're going to negotiate with the uh, with the the plaintiff, and it's going to settle out of court. Because if it has to go to court, then the fact that uh, this African American man was discriminated against is probably going to be made apparent. It's going to be made obvious. And so you know, it it kind of gets boring, and it's and it's kind of like I feel like going around in circles sometimes. But I do it as just as a service to the community. How did non how do non white people get mistreated by racist man and racist woman directly and indirectly in your area of the world? Oh, of course this is the West. Uh I think the most insidious forms of uh mistreatment and racism are probably the ones that are not so obvious. Uh, you know, when you see signs, um, when someone uses the N word, um, that's that's pretty obvious. But when you apply for a job and you believe or have evidence that you're the most qualified and you don't get the job and you don't understand why you got the job, uh, then I think that creates a level of stress because it's, it's, it's not so obvious. Or when you want to rent that apartment in a neighborhood where there's no African Americans, uh, you have the uh, the money to pay for the apartment, but uh, when you look in a newspaper and you arrive to the apartment to interview with the uh, owner, and they tell you, well, someone just got there 10 or 15 minutes before you did. Those kind of things begin to accumulate. And I think they, they play on your humanity and eventually play on your, sat, on your sanity. And people who are normally victims of that kind of behavior, uh, victimism is just one strategy for trying to escape that. And that's unfortunate because I think it's affecting us as uh, black Americans at a level that we're not – really aware of in many instances and I part of my work is to try to get this out and talk about it know that it's in existence how do white people function around beg your pardon how do people function around you how do people function around me how how do white people function around? I'm in academia, so I most of the people that I interact with are, are white Americans, and I think it's a good experience for persons of color and black people to interact with white Americans because I think you get a more a more accurate um, impression and opinion. Um, if you grow up in an all black neighborhood, an all ghetto area you don't oftentimes get the opportunity to interact with uh, persons of European descent. So you tend to stereotype them in the same way that they stereotype us. Uh, there are a number of white Americans that I've come in contact with that I'd much rather be in a foxhole with, say, than a Clarence Thomas or um, uh, a, a Ward Connolly. They are, those p type of people do exist. I refer to them as the John Brown wing of the white community. You know, John Brown fought to end slavery. John Brown was also a white male. So I think in interacting with white people in in this uh, in academia, I have come to meet all kinds. Some are good, just like black people. Some are bad. Our our challenge is to try to connect with the ones who um, mean good for black people and and deal with the others as we see fit. Um, what do you do when you are around uh, white people that practice racism, white supremacy? I didn't. I didn't hear your, your question. I. Oh, go ahead. Um, 
Um, what do you do when you are on white people that practice racism? What do I do? I really don't frequent any place where there's going to be uh, overt racism or discrimination. I try to avoid uh, associating uh, with those kinds of people. Uh, I'm sure there are people who uh, probably are racist, but they don't make it known to me. But if, if I'm aware that those kinds of people are in my presence, uh, certainly I, it's not some place that I, that I choose to be. I also choose to uh, confront them using my intellect versus physical confrontation. Once you, once you uh, regress to the physical confrontation, then you've pretty much lost because you're going to have law enforcement and you're going to have all of the institutions that are going to be in opposition to you. But if you use your intellect, I find that that's the most uh, potent means of being successful in, in accomplishing non-discriminatory ends. That's, that's what's worked for me. I know that on your website um, you talk the teaching uh, to uh, to explain racism uh, among non-white people. How does talking about the bleaching uh, syndrome explain racism to non-white people? Uh, as I indicated earlier, much of academia is influenced by uh, Eurocentrism, and so the bleaching syndrome has been going on probably since the first. Africans arrived in Jamestown, Virginia in 1601. Um, the bleaching syndrome not only refers to skin color, but it refers to the ability of people to try to bleach any aspect of themselves that they deem to be um, a stigma. So if your skin is dark, yes, you want to bleach it because lighter skin is idealized. Also, if uh, your hair is kinky in a world where most hair is straight, then you want to add some concoction to your hair to get straight hair. And, in fact, we know that the first legitimate millionaire in the African-American community was a lady who made her money selling hair care products. Her name was Madam C.J. Walker, and she was a millionaire back in about the 30s or the 40s. And I think, uh, you know, the appeal of her products were given to the fact that we didn't talk about the bleaching syndrome, but it existed among African Americans at that time. They wanted to get lighter skin. They wanted to get straighter hair because that's what was idealized in America. And in fact, um, Africans, people of African descent were told and idealized as something that was inferior and something that particularly women, were ugly because they had African-esque features. So, of course, women want to be attractive. Um, so they mimicked the Eurocentric beauty ideal, which for black people leads us nowhere because we can only be what we are. And we need to idealize that rather than using or applying Eurocentric standards. Uh, that just won't get us anywhere. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any more questions at this time. Thank you. Gus, are you there? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Took me a moment to get my uh, mute button together. My apologies. Um, okay. You you talk about uh, in your book and the title again for folks. An, <clears throat> excuse me. An historical analysis of skin color discrimination in America, uh, published 2010. You talk about in your book how this victimism, um, not just non non black non white people are impacted by this, but even black people uh, suck up the pathology of white supremacy and act that out on other black people. Uh, you already referenced yes. some of the uh, current conservative politic Ward Connolly. Uh, took down the uh, affirmative action uh, statutes in California. Um, yes. You write, you write in your book how this is this is nothing new, uh, and I was hoping we could touch yeah. on that. I was going to read this is uh, a passage where you were talking about Marcus Garvey and the mistreatment that he suffered. Sure. Uh, this is yeah. on page forty-seven. Um, you write the association uh, prevailed in the most public 
historical exchanges between African-American leaders. Uh, in an editorial of The Crisis, an Atlanta University journal, as well as the official National Association for the Advancement of Colored People journal, light-skinned African-American W.E.B. Dubois labels black leader Marcus Garvey as fat, black, and ugly, implying that dark features were unattractive. This was not a singular incident. A high-ranking NAACP official used similar language referring to Marcus Garvey as a Jamaican Negro of unmixed stock, in quotes, and implying that pronounced African features and dark skin were not the least complimentary. Um, I guess, can you talk about how this is this has been a long running problem uh, for black people uh, and something that we really, I guess, don't talk about in a way to try to correct this? Yeah, and that's the instance uh, referred to regarding W.E.B. Du Bois is uh, very complex because there is no one I hold in higher esteem than W.E.B. Du Bois. He was the first African-American man to receive a Ph.D. from Harvard. Uh, he also had a Ph.D. from the University of Berlin, and he spent most of his life uh, dedicated to the causes of uplifting black folk. He died a, a citizen of Ghana. He left the U.S. and uh, resided in Ghana, an African country, obviously, and he dedicated his life to uh, his people, which he identified as African-American. But uh, during during his, his heyday, there was still this skin color, unspoken skin color issue in the black community, and he talked about uh, this notion of what he referred to as a talented tenth. And the talented tenth were so-called the intellectually gifted among the African-American community, and it was their responsibility uh, to go to the medical schools, go to the law schools, uh, to become the attorneys, to defend the community, uh, to promote the health of the community. But unfortunately, most of those talented 10th African-Americans also happened to be light-skinned. So there was that unspoken tension there, but at the same time, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was very committed to the upliftment of the African-American community, and he was very Afrocentric uh, in his intellectual pers uh, perspective. So it's, it's, it's kind of complicated. Um, I don't think uh, he realized the damaging effects of the exchange he had with uh, Garvey, and of course, you know that's that was that was years ago, but uh, he himself was often criticized uh, by the white community for his positions against white racism, and he's published numerous uh, books that have become uh, classics today. And as a matter of fact, they're still read. He's credited with one of the first and foremost sociological studies ever done in something called the Philadelphia Negro which is a very extensive book detailing and defining the black uh, community in uh, Philadelphia. So W.E.B. Du Bois is an icon in the black community, but he was not immune to the issue of skin color, which unfortunately most of us as African Americans had internalized based on the antebellum, uh, colonialism, and otherwise Eurocentric influences. So we have mm -hmm. to take, I think, Du Bois with a grain of salt. Mm. Well, I'm I'm glad you shared that because I, I certainly was not bringing that up to uh, talk bad about W. E. B. Du Bois. Um, he he is a victim of of racism, white supremacy, just like myself. Um, I don't think any of us uh, are immune from you know that pathology of victimism uh, that white supremacy produces. Um, and this, I wanted to read this example. And again, I'm not. I think listeners know I'm very much against. Um, complaining about other victims, just pointing this out in an effort to correct behavior. Um, you talk about uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas uh, in your book as well. And uh, I didn't know this. I want to share this for listeners, but also keep in mind, Clarence Thomas is a victim of white supremacy. Uh, he, too, has sure. been mistreated. In Matter of fact, I'll just read. This is on page, uh, page 50 of your book. Uh, so this is page 50. Uh, Justice Thomas grew up in the 1950s. Due to having dark skin color, he was ridiculed by friends as ABC, an acronym meaning America's Blackest Child. Both black and white children 
in his southern Georgia town referred to him by such a name. In the 1950s, prior to the Black is Beautiful movement, ABC, America's Blackest Child, was the cruelest of names a black child could have. In addition, as the only black student enrolled in a Southern Catholic boarding school, Thomas was the daily butt of untold racist insults. Whites were known to hurl verbal insults at Thomas for all to hear. Smile, Clarence, so we can see you, a white classmate yelled after lights out. Thomas himself admitted to a period of self-hate in his life, which as a black conservative, he projected onto other blacks as evidence of victim group discrimination. When submission to whites failed, he assumed there was nothing he could do to earn their respect. However, vis-a-vis -vis skin color, Thomas found little sympathy in the black community and experienced other manifestations of ridicule on a daily basis. I uh, just wanted you to share with this sort of background. As a, I, I did not know that. I had never heard of the ABC acronym. When you are subjected, any black person, black people, I would right. say especially, subjected to yeah. this sort of torment and abuse daily, it becomes yeah. very understandable how you can end up being, you know, very, he said he yeah. was self-hating, and you can end up taking that out on other black people. Exactly. And, and, you know, going through that adolescent period, most of us kind of would experience something about ourselves uh, that we may get ridiculed about. That's just the nature of adolescence. And uh, with Dr. Tom, uh, Clarence Thomas, uh, he just didn't get beyond that. He, didn't, he couldn't resolve that and move and, and grow out of it. So rather than um, move forward, uh, he internalized a lot of that hatred and unfortunately vented it toward Af other African Americans. So he wanted to distance himself from the African American community. When he entered law school, he went to Yale Law School uh, rather than going to criminal law or something to benefit the black community, he went into corporate law where he would have very few, if any, black clients. And of course, he's interracially married. That doesn't mean anything as far as I'm concerned, but it's just fits a pattern of him taking every opportunity he could to distance himself from the black community, which I don't think was irrelevant or is irrelevant to his political views today. And in fact, he's completely divorced himself um, probably entirely from his black roots. He lives and socializes in a completely white world, and there he's apparently more comfortable. And that's unfortunate. That's, that's one of the adverse effects that this uh, victimism, uh, the result of racism that affects black people like Clarence Thomas. Context of white supremacy, um, you touched on he, uh, Clarence Thomas married a white woman. Uh, Ward Connolly also uh, married a white woman. Yeah. Um, that you have a, a concept in your book called uh, urogamy, which I think yeah. definitely relates to the victimism and trying to distance oneself from non-white people and to get closer, as close as possible to white people. I just wanted to share, this is a quote from France Fanon, who also married a white person. Um, in his book, uh, Black Skin, White Mask, uh, this is on yeah. page 63, he writes, uh, out of the blackest part of my soul, Across the zebra striping of my mind surges this desire to be suddenly white. I wish to be acknowledged not as black, but as white. Uh, now, who but a white woman can do this for me? By loving me, she proves that I am worthy of white love. I am loved like a white man. I am a white man. Her love takes me onto the noble road that leads to the total realization. I marry white culture, white beauty, white whiteness. When the restless hands caress those white breasts, they grasp white civilization and dignity and make them mine. Very 
profound passage, uh, Franz Fanon, Black Skin, White Mask, and I think it relates to your concept of urogamy. Uh, could you kind of explain that for our listeners? Okay. Franz Fanon was uh, a psychiatrist, and he grew up of, under much more overtly racist circumstances than uh, most of us today. In fact, uh, he grew up under a more colonial system of government than we have here in the U.S. have experienced. And uh, what he refers to in a marriage to uh, his wife, I think today is relevant to the term I use, urogamy. I don't find urogamy as relevant to African Americans as I do among Asian Americans. Urogamy is just a dramatic display of uh, the bleaching syndrome. And if you understand that Europe occupies the height, the political, economic, and social height of humanity, then those persons who are amongst or members of racial groups below that height, well, they increase their status by marrying someone of European descent. So Asian women in particular, it's dramatically obvious, uh, Age, most Asian groups, and we're talking about a broad spectrum here, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, there's a, it's a very diverse group of persons who call themselves Asian. So it may be more true for some and less true for others, but the typical Asian engages in what's referred to as endogamous marital patterns. That is, they marry within the group. But when they engage in exogamous marital patterns, the last census uh, statistics that I looked at, which was about, 10 years ago, actually, uh, you had about 97, 98% Asian Caucasian marriages, and those were almost always Asian female Caucasian male. And by marrying an, a Caucasian male, in the mind of an Asian female, her status is increased. Uh, to marry someone of color, particularly a person of African descent or a person of Latino descent, represents a decrease in her status. So she is likely to avoid matrimony with men of color because they decrease her status. Now, when you find an Asian woman who is very well educated, uh, may have some measure of wealth, they will oftentimes marry white males who are less educated and who have less wealth, but something called the exchange theory uh, she marries him in exchange for the racial status that he can bring to her and any children that they may have. Um, and I've talked about this issue with marriage and family journals, again, because of that Eurocentric perspective, you don't read about it. But it's been going on, again, since, uh, since this country was founded, probably. And it's particularly prevalent, uh, I think, most likely among, among women, among females, particularly Asian females. Mm. So that's the bleaching syndrome. Wow. Wow. I think the term uh, Franz Fanon he used, which is, is similar to your concept, is uh, hallucinatory whitening, um, which I think hits it, hits it right on the head. Um, you, you also talk about the, the concept of passing, and yes. I hadn't really thought of passing as, as a form of uh, uh, victimism. Uh, as, as yes. this is something that also contributes to mistreatment of black people. But reading your yes. work, it, it, made, it made total sense. And uh, yes. it reminded me of uh, Langston Hughes, uh, oh. incredible writer. Uh, his book, Ways of White Folks, phenomenal read. I would encourage folks to check it out. He has a passage where I think this right in line with what you uh, talk about in your book, uh, and he writes, this is a, a fictional letter, but I think it's, man, I'm sure something like this has been written many times over. Uh, and he writes, uh, Dear Ma, I felt like a dog passing you downtown last night and not speaking to you. You were great, though. Didn't give a sign that you even knew me, let alone that I was your son. If I hadn't had the girl with me, Ma, we might have talked. I'm not as scared as I used to be about somebody taking me for colored anymore just because I'm seen talking on the street to a Negro. I guess in looks, I'm sort of suspect proof anyway. You remember what a hard time I used to have in school trying to convince teachers I was really colored? 
Sometimes, even after they met you, my mother, they wouldn't believe it. They just thought I had a mulatto mammy. Since I've begun to pass for white, nobody has ever doubted that I am a white man. Where I work, the boss is a southerner and is always cussing out Negroes in my presence, not dreaming I'm one. It is to laugh. Funny thing, though, Ma, how some white people certainly don't like colored people, do they? If they did, then I wouldn't have to be passing to keep my good job. They go out of their way sometimes to say bad things about colored folks, putting it out that all of us are thieves and liars or else diseased, consumption and syphilis and the like. No wonder it's hard for a black man to get a good job with that kind of false propaganda going around. I never knew they made a practice of saying such terrible things about us until I started passing and heard their conversations and lived their life. But I don't mind being white, Ma, and it was mighty generous of you to urge me to go ahead and make use of my light skin and good hair. It got me this job, Ma, where I still get $65 a week in spite of the depression. And I'm in line for a promotion to the chief office secretary. If Mr. Weeks goes to Washington, when I look at the colored boy porter who sweeps out the office, I think that's what I might be doing if I wasn't light-skinned enough to get by. No matter how smart that boy would get to be, they wouldn't hire him for a clerk in the office. Not if they knew it. Only for a porter. That's why sometimes I get a kick out of putting something over on the boss who never dreams he's got a colored secretary. But, Ma, I felt mighty bad about last night. The first time we'd met in public that way, that's the kind of thing that makes passing hard. Having to deny your own family when you see them. Of course, I know you and I both realize it is all for the best. But anyhow, it's terrible. I love you, Ma, and I hate to do it, even if you say you don't mind. I will stop there. This goes on. Uh, he talks about being with this white woman and, you know, how he has to accept some of her racist remarks and not really say anything either. Um, can you kind of talk about how this is just another form of victimism? Right, uh, particularly with uh, lighter skinned uh, African Americans, during the forties, they were referred to as uh, tragic mulattoes, and the tragedy of their circumstances was that they looked white, but they had black roots and black family, so they were always struggling with this issue of how to identify themselves, and also they worked with the master, so to speak. So they were exposed firsthand to some of the ugly, uh, discriminatory accusations and uh, comments made about black folk. And essentially, those comments were directed at them, but they could not, they were not in a position to be able to respond. And again, because of the Eurocentric um, influence in academia, that's not something that has gotten a lot of attention in the literature. In 1936, there was a movie that was made called Imitation of Life, which addressed this tragic mulatto situation. It was remade again in 1959, starring a white actress by the name of Lana Turner. And the story was about a light-skinned African-American girl. Her mother was very dark-complected contrastingly dark complected and this young girl by the time she came 14 or 15 like a normal girl she wanted to begin dating and she grew up in a white environment because her mother was a maid to a wealthy white woman so they lived in a white neighborhood and this young girl had white friends etc and when dating started well that's when it became apparent that she was black because the people in the neighborhood knew her mother was black. So she decided to pass, and she separated herself from her mother, moved to another location, and make a long story short, 
She treated her mother very, very poorly. And the movie ends with her returning to the town when her mother had actually died basically from a broken heart because of her daughter. And you see her crying on a casket and, and apologizing to her mother for what she had done. But this was a young girl. She was torn between the experiences that she had had as a lighter-skinned black girl who could pass for white, and she wanted to live a quality of life that whites lived, but in fact, she was African-American. Uh, today, you have that same individual, but they are not, they're not as likely to have to uh, conceal their identity and past. And they, it's this whole biracial, mixed-race movement now. They want to identify and embrace not only uh, the black roots in their family, but any other uh, ethnic heritages that they may have as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tragic instance that we have done, as black people have done to ourselves. And the other side of it is uh, not every light-skinned black person who can pass wants to pass. But unfortunately, a lot of us in the black community uh, give those individuals a difficult time. Oftentimes, we challenge their ethnicity, we challenge their blackness. And many of these persons want nothing more than just to be accepted as black by black people. So I can't, I'm going to take the position that I can't control what white Americans think about black people, but I think I can have some influence about what black people think about black people. And that's why I talk about victimism and passing and the bleaching syndrome, et cetera, because I think if we can start some dialogue, then it can bring some understanding, and with some understanding you can get some forgiveness and then some healing, hopefully. Mm. I agree. Uh, again, our guest, uh, Dr. Ronald Hall, um, and you, you brought up uh, now, I guess it's uh, biracial uh, and that, that whole movement and, and even the term, uh, which I think is very interesting. And again, it's not about putting down particularly any of the non-white people who are victims of racism, just trying to get clarity to help solve this problem. Um, you write about that term uh, biracial. This is on page 125 uh, in the chapter uh, Biracial Americans the advantages of white blood, uh, you write, uh, talking about uh, quote-unquote biracial uh, people, they marry exclusively but are not averse to marrying darker-skinned blacks or socializing with them in the event of some exceptional wealth or notoriety. Succinctly put, biracial Americans being closer to white are not given to the overtly racist strategies of the past. However, advocating a separate biracial category in consideration of the social and political implications is a covert means of victim group discrimination which encourages a similar outcome. I thought that was real important. Could you kind of uh, break that down for our listeners about that, the whole term biracial and how that is a kind of a more covert form of the same behavior? Yes. Um, when we find uh, lighter-skinned African-Americans marrying darker-skinned African-Americans for uh, specific reasons, it's not considered to be overtly racist. It's very subtle, but it's also reflective of the way that we have internalized uh, pathological norms based on skin color and race, uh, and it's most apparent, most dramatically apparent. And I hate to be critical of uh, Miss Miss Oprah Winfrey, but you know she's a she's a an icon and she's a noted figure. So when I mention her name, people uh, know exactly who I'm talking about. But um, uh, Oprah Winfrey has mentioned in in uh, some of her autobiographical information uh, how. Um, depressed she felt and how ashamed she felt about her black features. She used to put a clothespin on her nose because she wanted a keen nose. She didn't like her broad, uh, flat African nose, and she was uncomfortable with her kinky hair. And she was obviously infatuated with these mulatto-looking, light-skinned black males. And, of course, today she's, I don't think she's married. She considered her uh, living Stedman Graham, her living partner, I don't know exactly what term she uses, but uh, Oprah is a billionaire with a B. And her husband does not equal her in monetary stature, 
he may have as much education. I'm not sure about that. But he is certainly not her socioeconomic equal. But because he is a mulatto, biracial type of individual, then someone, a billionaire black woman like Oprah Winfrey, would find him attractive and, in fact, find him eligible. And when you see that as a kind of a pattern, then it, it, it gives uh, you know pause to think that maybe there is something to this um, idea that we've internalized these Eurocentric norms that, in the end, are pathological to black people in the way we treat one another. Wow. Um, I uh, <laughs> I think I, I had it took me a while in terms of just thinking about how that plays out with the whole biracial, uh, just the use of the term. Um, we had a guest on the program. Um, her name is Tiffany, and she made a lot of videos. She has a white parent and a non-white parent. And in her videos, she would always introduce them by saying, hey, it's biracial Tiffany. It's biracial Tiffany. And I just thought, wow, that is, I mean, once you hear this about 20 times, it's like, wow, you are really trying to make sure that people know. And I think when people say that, in my opinion, it's saying, hey, I have a white parent. I have a white parent. I'm not just a non-white person. I mean, it, at least that's the way it comes across to me. Does that does that make yeah. sense? Well, I mean, it, it's not only is she saying suggesting she has a white parent, but she's suggesting she's not she's um, she's something other than black. Mm -hmm. And again, that is not new as well. During the antebellum period, uh, particularly in Louisiana, uh, you had the Creoles, and they are basically mixed race of what would be referred to as biracial people today, and Creoles wanted to be white, but they knew they could not be accepted as white, but they wanted to distance themselves from the black community. And so Creoles in Louisiana wanted to create a three-tiered racial system. They wanted to have whites at the top, African, traditional African Americans at the bottom, and mixed race, middle-class uh, African Americans in the middle rank uh, of the uh, hierarchy. So they were not white but they wanted people to know that they were not black. And these individuals were usually better educated. They had a little wealth because they may have been the offspring of, of, uh, of white fathers who may have assigned them some wealth upon their death or left the money in their will. And many of them were educated uh, in the Sorbonne in Paris at a time when uh, the most African American could expect would be maybe a third or fourth education level education, if that. Uh, the most famous Creole-descended person I can think of, uh, someone most of us know is Byron uh, Bryant Gumbel, who's retired from uh, journalism now. But Bryant Gumbel is around 60 years old, 62, 63. Uh, Bryant Gumbel's father was a judge. So he was an African-American man who was a judge probably during the 30s and the 40s. So for an African-American man to be a judge during that time was an obvious accomplishment given the obstacles that black people faced but creoles had a different kind of uh, tradition a different kind of uh, social and political heritage that um, benefited persons who were lighter skinned that um, darker skinned african americans couldn't take advantage of and so that 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 kind of uh, i guess that attitude has kind of evolved and still is in existence to some extent today uh, by such persons as the young lady you mentioned who wants to emphasize that she's biracial, which just is another way of saying um, it's a bleaching syndrome. I'm not, I'm not black. Mm. Wow. A part of our victimization, I say that again, a part of our victimization, not, you know, trying to beat up on any, any non-white people. Um, in in reading your book, um, you also talk about uh, different non-white groups. We touched on that a little bit. Um, you talk about how this evolved uh, with the Native American population uh, in the United States, uh, and touching on how, at least initially, it seems that they were uh, pretty accepting uh, to everyone. They didn't have big hang-ups, uh, at least initially, around darker skin, lighter skin, but with the encroachment of white people that changed drastically uh, to what we have now. Uh, there's a, a recent news report. Uh, this is from uh, September 14th of this year uh, where Cherokee Indians, uh, they proudly announced that we are free to oust blacks. Um, and I mean, this time. is a that long good article. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, can, yeah. can you kind of talk about how this has played out in their community? 
Well, first of all, I should say that when we talk about Native Americans, Indians, uh, indigenous people, we have to realize that uh, when the Europeans arrived that there were literally hundreds of Native groups with different languages, uh, cultures, norms, etc. So it's, it's difficult to talk about them as if they're this monolith. So what we find with one group as pertains to black people may not necessarily be apparent amongst other groups. But if we're speaking about Cherokee, uh, Cherokee were among the most white-influenced and giving to white influences of all Native groups. As a matter of fact, President Roosevelt referred to them as the most civilized. And the reason he did that was because they were the most likely, uh, the most inviting and accepting of white culture. And at some point, they recognized that Africans were denigrated, and in order for them to be more accepted by whites, they would denigrate blacks as well. And, in fact, you had some Cherokee Indians who owned slaves and who were part of that uh, slave environment. But to be honest about it, to be fair about it, it wasn't the same kind of slave relationship that existed between blacks and whites. In many instances, a black slave might marry a Cherokee wife. So Cherokees, I don't think, were initially uh, prejudiced against persons of African descent. It was merely a result of white colonial influences. And we shouldn't be surprised today, given that maybe there's some wealth uh, implied if you can uh, prove that you are of native descent. So to push out an element of the Native American community who may have had some roots in the uh, slave community is just perhaps a way of uh, making a political statement to appease uh, white interests. We're not involved with this inferior group. Or it's a way of uh, limiting that amount of money or that wealth that's available to the Native community by way of casinos and, and, and other kinds of benefits that uh, Native Americans have accrued. But I, I thought that was very interesting that they would go to the extent of ousting people uh, in their community who may have had some relationship with the slave community. Now, you know Seminole Indians are the exact opposite. Many Seminole Indians, if you look at the historical pictures, look like they're African Americans. Many slaves who escaped would escape to Seminole Indian camps and join that community and be accepted by that community. So. While Cherokee may not have been as accepting, there were other groups who certainly were much more accepting. Mm -hmm. And you you talk about that in the book as well, uh, where sometimes uh, black people uh, and Native Americans joined together to fight against white people, uh, recognizing that they had you know a common problem uh, of racism, and white supremacy. Um, what I also found very interesting this was news to me: um, Crispus Attucks. Uh, yes. Frederick Douglass, they also um, recognized as black people, but they also yes. have Native American roots. And yes. you touch on yes. the fact that another part of this victimism that Native Americans do not reference these folks at all. Um, can you share some of that with our listeners? Uh, well, again, I think it's because African Americans were so, so denigrated. And also, if a person, an Indian, a mixed-blood Indian gained the status of an African-American. That meant that they might even be subject uh, to slavery. But in fact, a large portion of the African-American community today uh, has some roots in the Native American community. And a gentleman you mentioned earlier, Langston Hughes, had Cherokee roots. The writer Langston Hughes was part Indian. But uh, you typically may not be accepted or recognized as native or Indian among Indians and by Indians unless you're Indian on both sides. And see, I think that deserves both our communities because we, we have a lot more in common uh, than not. And if we separate ourselves and don't recognize the common ties and bonds and the common history that we have, uh, I think we do ourselves a disservice and we don't take advantage of, of the potential influences that we might have to to better our situ better our quality of life. 
and that's a, but there's a strong tie between the black community and the Native com, uh, American community historically that may not have survived intact today as as it once was, unfortunately. Again, context of white supremacy, uh, our guest, uh, Dr. Ronald Hall, um, certainly uh, I think the same would apply what we've talked about to so-called uh, the Latino population. Uh, in fact, I was remembering just reading your work, I was reminded of the term uh, mayate. Uh, I first learned about it a few months back, a uh, derogatory term uh, that's used, I guess mostly it says uh, what I read online by uh, in Mexico, uh, a derogatory term for black people. Um, it's, I guess, the equivalent of nigger. Um, that this uh, this pathology of white supremacy uh, picked up worldwide, and same thing applies in terms of Latino people who come and want to distance themselves from black people uh, and show that they have more in common with white people. The same in terms of uh, pre preference for lighter skin. Uh, all of the same pathologies that we've kind of discussed, you see that play out with uh, the Latino community as well. Um, what I did think was really interesting, um, you have a passage uh, in your book, I believe it's on page uh, 78, where you're talking about <clears throat> uh, Latinos being subjected to abuse by enforcement officers. Uh, I have it right. This is on page 78. You write, the lower socioeconomic status of local police, on the other hand, means they are less secure about their role as men given the implications of wealth for masculinity and societal terms. The largest in number, they are the least educated, least skilled, and lowest paid. They are in many cases similar to the Latino males as a class against whom they may be called upon to exercise force. Their masculinity is particularly threatened because they do not have the class buffer to protect their self-esteem. They tend to be more primal in their regard for Latino males and are obsessed with behaviors they perceive in a sexual context. This results in an excessive urge to confront Latino males with violent force when it is not necessary, convincing themselves that it is to uphold the law. The motivating factors are to resist their assimilation and to enable a concept of masculinity that is defined and threatened on the basis of dark skin and which is relevant to law enforcement activities. I thought that was just super important. I was hoping you could share some more details about that passage with our audience. Well, a lot of uh, this back and forth about skin color and race uh, has to do with power and has a lot of sexual connotations to it. Uh, in a psychoanalytic context, a, a person that is darker skinned represents someone who's dominant and someone who's powerful. And that's a belief, I think, that's probably held worldwide. So when you have a dark-skinned male, you are looking at the essence of masculinity. So any lighter-skinned male confronted by a darker-skinned male is immediately going to have his masculinity challenged, whether anything is said or not. That is true whether you're talking about a black male and a white male or a dark-skinned black male and a light-skinned black male. You know, in the black community, lighter-skinned black men are, have always been regarded as pretty men, pretty boys. During the antebellum, they were referred to as run-round men because they were not men to the extent that they were dominant and they could exercise their force of will. Of course, you always have exceptions, but what their skin color represented was a challenge to their masculinity. And you have that when you have a white police officer confronting a black male. So that black male may be subjected to aggression by a white male police officer that he would not exercise against another member of the community because just by virtue of being black, 
and confronting this person with his masculinity, that is a threat. And you see that threat acted out any number of times. Rodney King probably was the most dramatic example of that um, several, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago now. And the ability to aggress upon or dominate someone who threatens you rescues your masculinity personally. So this is why when black males are confronted by police officers, black and white in many instances, they oftentimes have to be concerned about what their masculinity or their skin color represents to this person. Otherwise, the uh, situation frequently gets out of hand. Uh, I will uh, give out the call-in number in case folks want to dial in if you have a question. Uh, the number 760-569-7689. And the code is 564-943-POUND. Uh, one more time, 760-569-7676. And the code is 564-943-POUND. Um, before I check in uh, to see if anybody has questions, uh, Justice, did you have any uh, other questions you wanted to ask Dr. Hall? What did you talk about at the uh, Oxford University Roundtable in the UK? Well, actually, that was uh, on a different topic. It was on a topic of terrorism uh, in the uh, in the world, and I and this is going back a couple of years. So I'm just recalling off the top of my head. I was relating to terrorism and terroristic threats to the authoritarian personality, which is just very a, a personality that's very control, uh, control-oriented control and very rigid. So rather than negotiate, uh, people who uh, descend into terrorism are usually people who uh, are simply influenced by control. It must be my way, and I'm not willing to negotiate. So obviously when you have people that can't negotiate, usually the end result is, is violence or some form of uh, terrorism. How did you become an expert witness in America's first skin color discrimination court uh, case between non-white people in, in 1990? Well, actually, um, I was contacted by a professor who contacted an attorney who then contacted me uh, back in 1990, and because the professor was in the Atlanta, Georgia area where the case took place, I was actually in Wisconsin at the time, so the professor called me asking me if I'd be willing to uh, serve as, as a witness, and then I said yes, and then he gave my number to the attorney who, who took the case, and, and that's how that happened. Uh, the lady who was involved was a lady from uh, Seattle, Washington. She had moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and taken a job with the IRS. And she was lighter-skinned, and her supervisor, the darker-skinned supervisor, was actually from Louisiana. Um, I believe she was from New Orleans. And so this darker-skinned black woman had had probably a lot of negative experiences with lighter-skinned African Americans in Louisiana. And although the lighter-skinned black woman that was involved in the suit was not from uh, New Orleans, to, to the, the darker-skinned uh, lady at the IRS, this lighter-skinned woman represented to her what most people in New Orleans who were lighter-skinned represented to her. So um, I testified at that case, and as I indicated, uh, uh, since then there have been literally hundreds of cases filed. As a matter of fact, there have been a couple more that have been filed uh, in Atlanta the one I testified on involved uh, two women, but there have also been a couple of cases involving black men as well. Why did you publish books on racism and skin color? Oh, that's that's been my, my academic interest. It's something that has always been a curiosity for me. I Early on, I didn't understand why people differentiated uh, amongst groups based on their racial background and, and their uh, skin color and their phenotype. And so I began to read more about it. And as I read more, it actually posed more questions to me. And 
So I continued to read and continued to read, and I decided to uh, make that the topic of uh, a Ph.D. dissertation. And um, I've never been bored of the subject for 20 years, and I've been studying and writing about it. And it's just so obvious to me that uh, so much of it influences the way we act and the way we live, but it doesn't get the kind of attention that, um, that I think it merits. People are more likely to talk about race and not so much about skin color, though skin color is really much, I think, much more dramatic and much more obvious. Yeah, but, but that's unfortunate. If you have offspring, how do you help your offspring learn and understand racism, white supremacy? Well, I think uh, as soon as children are old enough to understand the differences in people, they need to be made aware of racism and prejudice, particularly if they are children of color. Uh, and if they live in America and live in the U.S., uh, they're going to be confronted by some of these issues. And I think if you talk to them and explain to them in a way that they can understand, and of course you have to be, um, you have to be gentle about it with young kids, but uh, just expose them, make them aware a little bit at the time, so when they are confronted uh, by some of these issues, they won't be so shocked and they won't be so unprepared in how they should respond. Because if you if you grow up to age of four or five and you think that everyone is equal, and then one day you're confronted by some of these discriminatory behaviors, uh, you don't have anything in your background of experience to be able to uh, to understand. So I think as as young as you can reach kids when they're old enough to understand, young enough to understand, um, then I think you should start. And as a matter of fact, Kenneth B. Clark, who did the Dahl studies in the 1950s, he said that children become aware of race as early as the age of three. Now, they may not be able to articulate it, but they can sense that there is some difference. And so you need to, particularly with black kids, you need to make them understand that those differences and those accusations have nothing to do in reality with who they are and what they should feel about themselves. Otherwise, uh, they'll internalize uh, these norms, as so many of us have, and it can wind up being uh, destructive and pathological. Uh, what are some suggestions for things non-white people can do to deal with the stress of racism, white supremacy? Well, I think first there should be a consistent, constant uh, dialogue. I think when people can share experiences, that, that usually is therapeutic. I think our church, the church is probably the most viable institution in the black community. I think this issue needs to be addressed and confronted in the churches. Um, I think if you're in college, uh, your college student, regardless of what major you're in, you should take some course related to cultural diversity, uh, uh, race or racism, so that you can a gain not only uh, an experiential understanding of what's involved, but also an academic understanding, not just something that's emotional, but approach it as um, an intellectual topic. So perhaps you can get a little better understanding and you can deal with your own feelings. And, and, and uh, you know, I think it's extremely important just, just to share to share because when you share, then uh, people understand that they're not alone in what they're experiencing. And then when you know that someone else is being discriminated against in a way that's similar to what you're feeling, uh, it somehow lifts the burden, I think, and we can handle it emotionally a lot better as people. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Hall. Um, I don't have Thank any uh, more. Uh, I don't have any more questions uh, for you um, at this time. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, you can be back on the program. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some other people that dialed in who had a hand up with a question. Uh, is it all right if we take a few calls, Dr. Hall? Sure. Okay. I believe this is uh, our longtime listener, investor, who suggested you for the program. Uh, 404, if you had a question for Dr. Hall, uh, your line should be open. 404, did you have a question? Yes, greetings to you, Gus, and to Justice. How are we this evening? Uh, intensely victimized. 
<laughs> like I am. Too. Same here. Because <laughs> my internet was acting up with me, and I remember your script that you read about being monitored. So I said, okay, I guess I'm being, you know, playing around with my internet access. Dr. Hall, how are we this, yes. this evening? How are you? Well, as I said, being intensely victimized, but I'm enjoying the conversation, and of course, I'm very happy to, um, that you're on the program. And Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome, Om, Doctor. Because when you were mentioning some of the things that you were mentioning about the caste system that we have within the black community, and yes. which is something I'm very familiar with, with you mentioned with Brian Gumble. And, of course, yes. Mark Morial, he also came out of that background as well, out of yes. New Orleans, yes. where his father was um, was the first black mayor of New Orleans. So they all came out of that same Creole Cajun caste system that they have, as well as General Henri, who was also, during the Katrina incident, they all came out of that, So, because I'm yes. from the Louisiana Connection. And one of the things that you were mentioning um, with the, the different is with the blacks, and I got into it, I believe it was a couple of days, well, not got into it, let me correct that, because I was mentioning the same thing as you said, but within the black community, we don't like to talk about racism, not racism, but the race and the colorism that we have within our community. It's one of the dirty secrets that we have. We will right. rumble amongst ourselves about it, and we know it's a problem, because if we look back at our history from all of the civil rights leaders, they were all like yeah. kids. Yes. Look at all the preachers. They're all light skinned. Yes. So we know that there is there has always been that in our in our society where we tend to promote the lighter skinned ones and the medium shade ones would be next. But if you have a darker you, you would bear, you have to have some kind of um talent, maybe like Paul like Paul Robeson. You yes. have to be smart in the brain. You have to have a talent that you can use in order for you to bring yourself up to a certain level. Otherwise you're not going to be looked at or even be given a chance. Yes. So th that was just my commentary that, he, that, he, that I had to make, and I'm, I'm so glad. Oh, oh, by the way, you mentioned that situation with, I don't know if you touched on it, the case that you had with the IRS with a young lady who was um, where this incident, did you touch on that earlier? Because I missed part of the show. Did you touch on that in Atlanta where that yes. got you, where you had to testify on that case? Yes. Yes, I oh, did. Oh, you did touch on it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, because I, I do apologize for being redundant because I've I missed out on that. But these are things that happen because I've seen it daily on the workplace where you, yes. where blacks victimize each other, and we know it has That's to do right. with skin colorization, but we will yes. tend to overlook it and not pay any attention to it. But I do thank you for putting out the book there, and I do thank you for being bold. I know you probably got a lot of rocks thrown at you for saying it, but... <laughs> We do have yes, to say that's part things. of the job. Well, we have to clear it up because we have a lot of mental issues, and one of those, as you said, is the colorism that we need to talk about to overcome yes. this issue that we've had left over from slavery. Yes, I agree. Thank you very much, Gus and Justice, and I'll pause if I put myself on mute and let you get to the other callers. Good to hear from you, uh, 404. Thank you for the suggestion. Again, very, very constructive guest. Um. Let's see, the person who dialed in last four digits, 9121, 9121. Did you have a question uh, for Dr. Hall? This is Blacker. All oh, right on. Good to hear from you, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and hey, Justice, I haven't talked to you before, but um, hello, Justice, also. Oh, okay. Um, I'd like to ask um, Dr. Hall. Hey. I'd like to ask, ask Dr. Hall something real quick. Um, when I was growing up, and this is uh, early to mid-70s, um, we're talking from elementary school on maybe through uh, maybe the beginning of high school, I was, uh, and I've, I've told this story here before, I was tortured by, by and um, I'm, I'm dark-skinned. I would say, I would probably say uh, very dark-skinned. People would probably call me uh, very dark-skinned. But uh, growing up, I was tortured by um, children who looked exactly like me. And I was just wondering if you can give me some insight into the mind of thinking of someone who would do that to someone that looks exactly like them. Yeah, I, th I think that's an attempt, uh, again, of a person to salvage some of their own sanity, uh, you know, to acknowledge 
that you are darker skin in this culture, particularly if you particularly if you're female, um, is to acknowledge uh, the worst. And if a child can vent some of their own insecurities onto someone else. Uh, somehow that rescues for the moment, that may rescue some of their own self-esteem. Uh, with the, the experience that I talked about with uh, Clarence Thomas, um, that was extremely painful. Uh, I'm sure that the black children who criticized him and gave him a nickname probably were as dark as he. Uh, among many Indian Asian people, many Indian Asians are much darker complected than your typical African American, but they see themselves in many instances as better than or superior to African Americans because if they acknowledge their own darkness, then anything that they could say about an African American, they have to fact, in fact, accept about themselves. So, you know, I think men have a little bit more of an advantage. If I were going to explain it to a young black male, I would simply say you have to recognize that you are somewhat of a threat because you are considered the essence, the essential symbol of masculinity. And, that, and that's, that's universal. Men are Very dark, good. women are fair. That's universal. Thank you. That's, that, that's very good. That's, that's uh, along the lines of what my parents would always tell me. And, they, and I think they kept me sane for, um, well, up until now. Um, I thank you for that um, answer. You're welcome. The person who dialed in um, on Skype, the uh, person who dialed in on Skype that had a question, uh, your line should be open. Uh, proceed. Hi, good evening. I have a quick question. Uh, you talked about the uh, caste system in, within the black community. Have you come across any information on how the African immigrant perhaps maybe want to differentiate themselves from, quote, unquote, black Americans? Oh, that's that's another unspoken that's another unspoken uh, pathology in our community. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I, I know that it exists. You have persons who are from Barbados, uh, certain African countries, uh, uh, certain countries in the Caribbean. You recognize that they come under colonial influences, and coming to America, the first thing that an immigrant learns is how to denigrate black folk. They learn that if they look black, that their first objective is by any means necessary, to quote Malcolm, to distance themselves and make sure that people understand, although they're black and look black, they are not African American. Because once you are identified as an African American, then you go on to live the quality of life that would be extended to an African American here, and obviously that's not something that even most African Americans want. So there's been this unspoken effort on the instance of, of, of many black immigrants to distance themselves and make sure that people understand that they are from some country other than the United States, and they're to be recognized and regarded as someone other than uh, a black American. And in fact, uh, white Americans will often treat black immigrants differently once they know that they're not black Americans. That's unspoken, but I'm, I'm well aware of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just uh, if you all have questions, uh, any of the other folks uh, who dialed in, uh, you can press star six if you're on the free HD line, uh, star eight if you are on the talk shoe line. Um, I also wanted to make sure I got I just wanted to share this anecdote, or actually I'll just get Dr. Hall. If you could share with our listeners, because I thought this was a really surprising way that this pathology can be manifested. Um, you have a, a discrimination case uh, in your book. This is on page 85. Uh, we are talking about a uh, Mexican restaurant manager in San Antonio and uh, how they manifested uh, this victimism through a white person. If you could share that incident with our listeners. If I recall correctly now, uh, that, that was a while ago, but I think you're talking about a case in San Antonio, Texas. And if this weren't such a, a pathological experience, it, it would be almost laughable. But in San Antonio, te Texas, and I, I didn't confer on this case. I simply uh, reviewed it in the literature. But a Mexican in San Antonio owned a Mexican restaurant, 
and the Mexican restaurant owner hired a white male to manage his restaurant. And the Mexican restaurant owner told the white male manager not to allow the darker-skinned Mexicans to work in view of the public. He wanted the dark-skinned Mexicans only to work in the kitchen where they can't be seen. And to his credit, the white male manager was concerned about this, so he complained to the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, about this Mexican restaurant owner, and the commission sued the restaurant owner, and the white male manager negotiated a settlement out of court. So here you have a case where a white male sued a darker-skinned Mexican male for discriminating against other darker-skinned Mexican people. So it's kind of come full circle. Wow, that's probably that's... the most dramatic, one of the most dramatic cases that, that I'm familiar with. And otherwise, if it weren't so painful, as I indicated, it would be laughable to me. The was the I guess the white manager in this case, if you recall, he was the plaintiff when this case went to court. He was the plaintiff. He complained wow. he complained about the Mexican restaurant owner discriminating against darker skinned Mexicans. Yes. Mm. <sighs> Lots of work to do. <laughs> oh, <laughs> The uh, I, I definitely wanted to make sure I was going to do anything I could if I had to ignore callers to make sure I got this part in. Um, you have a, a whole chapter where you talk about how another form of the victim victimism, victim groups discriminating against other victim groups, white women. And this I, I try to bring this up consistently. I think this is a major part of the problem where white women are seen as victims of patriarchy and it's it's white male patriarchy that is the problem where people totally overlook wait a minute, these white women are benefiting from this system, and in many instances, they are complicit. They are practicing racism, white supremacy against non white people. Can you share uh, some of that information? Yeah, the book uh, is about uh, groups that normally experience discrimination, and certainly you would account, you know, count women among those numbers because, as you indicated, this is a patriarchal society. But what people don't realize about, I guess you could call it the feminist movement, the genesis of, of white female activism, early on in the antebellum South you had a movement which I consider the genesis of today's feminine movement, of uh, white women who referred to themselves as the WKKK, which was just a, a female counterpart of the Ku Klux Klan. They were the women of the Ku Klux Klan. And at the time, they were advocating that women be allowed to vote. It was the suffrage, suffrage movement. And one of the ways that they rationalized their argument was that they assumed that white women were superior, not to black men but to black people so they should be allowed to vote not because they were eligible but because they were white and that activism uh, remained and I think it is prevalent today in the way that there has been an unspoken loose conspiracy to redefine and move the discourse in society from race to sex and gender. So many people want to take the position that, well, race is no longer an issue because we had the civil rights movement and now we have a black president. So there's obviously no more racism. But there's still sexism. And unfortunately, many of those who lead the women's movement have been able to incorporate a lot of black women into that movement. So they have convinced black women to define their issues not on the basis of race, but to find their issues on the basis of sex and gender. So uh, I believe Angela Davis now is more active in the women's movement and women's issues than she was than she is in racial issues that she was involved in during the 60s. So that that racial issue is still being maintained because the dialogue and the discourse has changed from race to uh, sex. And 
when we talk about uh, sex or gender, it's really still maintaining that white dominance, that white Eurocentric control. Only maybe now it's not males so much as it is males and females. And so the, to the extent that I still am confronted by racial issues, uh, those racial issues are considered less significant now because the major influence have decided that it's sex and gender. And that's unfortunate. Wow. I I thought it was, uh, I see, I'm going to get the other caller on the uh, talk shoe line next. Um, I thought it was extremely important. You talked about how uh, in many of the journals that deal with uh, complexion issues, skin color, uh, they totally ignore uh, black females' issue with skin bleaching, that that's just something that is totally uh, left out uh, of the dialogue completely. Could you, I guess, touch on that really yeah. quickly? Yeah, I, I, I write papers in, in academic journals, and it's a peer review process, and it's competitive. And uh, the two leading Journals. The last time I checked the databases, the two leading journals in social work, which have been publishing for 30, 40 years, according to the databases, they've not published anything on the issue of uh, skin color. And uh, there's a textbook called Human Behavior in the Social Environment, which I have used in the past in uh, classes. And in going to conferences, I know the authors of the textbook. So I happened to be at a conference one year, and I approached the lady who was the author of the book, and I asked her why didn't she include this issue of skin color, and, and she was a, a white female. And her response was that she couldn't include everything. Now, my thinking, black women are committing suicide. They're having stillbirths because they're uh, applying these toxic bleaching concoctions to their skin. Uh, African people are developing skin cancers because of the bleaching creams but she does consider it significant enough uh, to include in the textbooks. Now, if what's happening to women of color regarding the skin color issue was happening to white women, I guarantee you, you would have an act of Congress. But because it's people of color, it's women of color, it's, it's somehow trivialized, and that's unfortunate. Wow. An act of Congress, if it this was happening to Congress. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, the guest that called in uh, on the talk shoe line uh, that had a hand up, if you had a question for Dr. Hall, your line should be open. Uh, guest on the talk shoe line. Yes, greetings. This is uh, David. Um, greetings, uh, Dr. Hall. I have greetings. a question for you, sir. Yes. Um, are you familiar with Dr. Uh, medical doctor and psychiatrist uh, Dr. Welton's work? Yes, uh, Francis Press Welsey. Yes, yes, okay. Because I, I heard a lot of things you were talking about. Is like a lot of things were similar to what she uh, speaks about. So I was wondering if you were also familiar with her work. Yes, 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 I am. I, I've met. I would probably consider her one of the forerunners of the skin color issue. Um, although she talked about it more in a racial context, and she devised something that's referred to in the literature as the Crest theory, the Crest theory of racism and color confrontation. And in brief, essentially what her position is that people of color are the majority in the world, and people of European descent, lighter-skinned people, are maybe 15%, 20%. They are the minority in the world. And when you are different from the world's people and you're part of that world community, you have to resolve that differentness in your mind. And you can see your differentness either as, a result of your being not as good or that you're different because you're better. And according to Dr. Welsing, that's the genesis of white supremacy. My skin is light versus the rest of the world, not because I'm inferior, but because I'm actually superior to the rest of the world. And in order to manifest that superiority, it's necessary for you to politically, economically, and, soci and socially dominate the world's people of color because that's psychologically uh, advantageous. Yes, sir. And also, um, some of the things you're talking about, people of color, skin, and how they deal with it. Um, my mother, she claims that she doesn't see color and she never has, but 
I always said my mother's the first generation of brown skinned people in the family. Uh-huh. Uh, her, her mother, great grandmother, aunts, uncles, everybody had, um, I would say, you know, white people hair, uh, very fair skin, fair meaning white, and um, they were allowed to, you know, they lived in a black community, but they could intermingle with whites without whites realizing they were white. And right. one example is my great uncle, my mother's uncle, uh, was stabbed back in the 50s in the park. And um, he was rushed to a white hospital. Family yeah. went there to see him. Mm-hmm. And my mother, I think 14 at the time, uh, after school, went to go visit her uncle, which was at a white hospital. Yeah. And that's when they realized he was a colored man versus a white right. man. And he right. got transferred to a black hospital. But right. um, my mother claiming that she never saw a color when that, you know, even as a child, like you mentioned, people as young as three. But when I was a small child, I saw a difference, you know. Yeah, what people look like, but she, to this day, says she doesn't see color. Well, maybe that's the way she deals with it. I mean, if if she if she acknowledged that she saw color for her, that might dredge up a lot of very painful experiences that she'd rather not rather not relive. So by saying that she doesn't see color, she doesn't have to be confronted by things that she'd rather forget. Something right. like that. Well, her her one of her uncles said, I guess when she was at the age of, you know, uh, I guess interested in boys. And this is her mother's side of town where everybody uh, could pass her white or near white. Um, right. Don't bring home any bears. And I uh-huh. interpret that as black bears. Yeah. And so she, you know, even though she was brown and had, uh-huh. you know, ra- black people features and hair texture, uh-huh. you know, these you know, light-skinned relatives were telling her not to bring home any bears. Right. So, you know, but I, like you said, it's probably that's what it is. She just her way of dealing with the yeah. you know, reality by just pretending it doesn't exist. Right, right. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to. Uh, we have about eight minutes uh, left in the broadcast. If uh, anyone has questions, uh, you know, right on. Uh, person on talk to you, uh, person in front of DC. If you have a question for Dr. Hall, your line should be open. Hi, can I be heard? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, what do you feel is the uh, one or a few solutions or resolutions to the color sickness within the African-American black community? Well, as I, I kind of mentioned a little earlier, one of my, my life's work is to expose this issue, and I think black people can't control what white people and other groups do, but I think we can't control our own communities and our own mindset. And while a lot of the literature addresses some of the trials and tribulations that uh, darker-skinned African Americans encounter, there's another side to that. One, my next book is called Black Light, The Trials and Tribulations of Light-Skinned African Americans. And I think uh, we talk about what dark-skinned African Americans have endured, but we also, as black people, have not always treated um, lighter-skinned African Americans well. During the 60s, if you were lighter skinned and you had that, as your, one of your callers mentioned, white, uh, white hair, your identity was challenged. Your identity as a black person was challenged, and people would make accusations about you not really being black. I think that is unfair for a person to have their identity challenged. It's just as painful as a person like Clarence Thomas who was ridiculed for being too black. But nobody acknowledges that. When we talk about the skin color issue, it's always what darker-skinned blacks experience and feel. And that's unfortunate. But it's equally unfortunate also that we don't talk about what light-skinned African Americans feel. There are darker-skinned African Americans who want to distance themselves from the black community, just like there are light-skinned African Americans who want to be embraced by the African American community. So the only way we can become aware of that is to talk about it and acknowledge the pain that lighter skinned African Americans experience as well. Because I think pain is pain. It doesn't matter how it comes. And I think as black people, we are in a position to do something about it in our own communities. We control that. We don't have to internalize Eurocentric norms um, to our detriment. We can control ourselves. And and that's what I want to see and I want to contribute to. 
you think that the use of the terms black, light skin, dark skin, fair, are detrimental to this progress that you are talking about to come together? Or can we say, as a collective, we are non-white people? Uh, you know, I really don't think the term really makes, the terms you use make a difference. It's how, whether you allow someone else to define the terms or you define the terms for yourself. So if we say non-white people, uh, it doesn't matter if we say black. I think what happens is, that, you know, black has carried a negative connotation because that's the way Europeans have defined black, and we've bought into that. So as long as we define the terms, we empower ourselves. The terms themselves, I, I think, are, are benign. So would you agree that white supremacists or white collective in general have been the ones to define the terms for everyone on the planet, especially black. Oh, 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 it's no doubt about that. Europe is the center of Western, Western civilization is the center of world civilization. So what they see as norms, ideals, values, we've internalized. I mean, with, with the technology that we have today, I think Western civilization is more influential and potent than it has ever been. You see it in subtle ways, in, in commercials, in videos, in movies. You see who gets idealized and who gets rewarded and what they get idealized and rewarded for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Context of white supremacy, uh, again, our guest, Dr. Ronald Hall. Uh, we have about three minutes left. If you have a quick question you want to get in, you should get your hand up immediately. I'm not trying to do anything at the bell, so you should get your hand up right now. Um, I guess, number one, you mentioned uh, the film Imitation of Life, and I think there are quite a few uh, films that deal with uh, passing uh, and the issues that individuals who, non-white people who ha have a white parent and one non-white parent uh, that they face. Um, your work reminded me of the film uh, Anthony Hopkins, Nicole Kidman, The Human Stain. Uh, have you seen that film? I haven't. I haven't. Wow. It came out in 2003. Um, for listen, if you want a, a really interesting uh, take on racism, I would recommend that film. Uh, I just, it reminded me there. I won't spoil it, but uh, Anthony Hopkins, uh, if you can imagine, uh, he is passing. He's playing as a oh. as a, a non-white person who's passing. He has a, a non-white parent. And uh -huh. the crux of the, or one of the big parts of the dilemma in the film is that he's passing as a white person. He gets in trouble for allegedly making a racial slur. And... Uh -huh. His parents and family members are saying, hey, you can squash all this. Just tell him, hey, I'm a non-white person. And he's, oh, absolutely uh, not. Like, uh, we'll just have to ride this down and see where uh, it goes. I'm staying on the white team. I am not putting that in jeopardy uh, at all. And, I, I mean, uh, membership has its advantages. Um, uh, man, it's, uh, it's incredible. And it even touches on some of the issues we talked about before, uh, the uh, passage from Langston Hughes, where he's kind of uh, – he he gets he's dating that dating scene. I think that really uh, is a pivotal moment when you begin to grow up and you start looking for those sexual options. He ends up with a white female. He really likes her. She finds out that he oh wait a minute you're not really white. This has to end and that I mean huge part. Of, I won't spoil any more for folks, but yeah, I, I think uh, if you could, I guess as an end, the dating part. I think that's you touched on the the sexual. Tension, uh, both around right. policing. Dr. Welsing talks about that. Um, right. I guess your view, the the sexual stress that factors in for non-white yeah. people, whether it's trying to get a lighter complexion uh, mate or a white person, or just I don't want someone that's too dark. If you could kind of end on that, I think that would be great. Well, I think when we talk about some of these issues, it really uh, casts a, an, an element of, of evil on people who. Uh, who might engage in some of these practices, but and I don't want to justify uh, what's what's being done by some, but if you put it in an economic and a quality of life context, uh, I think we can better comprehend the situation. People who refuse to marry darker skinned persons recognize the implications not only for themselves and the life that they're able to have, but also the life of their offspring. 
And by saying that you want to marry, as, as you used to say, um, into Europe versus back to Africa, is simply saying that you want a better quality of life and a better future uh, for your children. In fact, um, the very first book I wrote on skin color called A Color Complex shortly after the trial that I tested for, my co-author was a lady by the name of uh, Kathy Russell. And her reasons for wanting to write the book was because she had been dating this African-American male for a few years, and she thought the relationship was serious and going to lead to marriage, but uh, her boyfriend informed her that while he cared for her, he could never bring her home as a potential spouse because she was simply too dark and he could not have light enough kids by her. And that was an ugly thing to say and to do, but in fact, he was being practical and recognized that having a child with her uh, would be to their disadvantage. So people who are very selective in their marital partners, uh, it's, it's, it's an ugly thing to do and to say, but I think it's, it's really practical. We've, some of us have given in to these Eurocentric norms and, and, and have submitted, and the result is a, patholo a pathology for ourselves and our people. I think, I think I've said that regularly. That uh, unfortunately, uh, the system of white supremacy has made abusing black people, especially black people and darker non-white people, they have made yes. that the practical thing to do. Uh, really, exactly. worldwide, they've made that exactly. the practical thing to do. Exactly. Um, thoroughly enjoyed having you on the program. I learned a ton. Uh, it, we definitely will be looking out for uh, your next publication. You said you're going to be focusing on the mistreatment of lighter-skinned black yes. people. I think that sounds super yes. constructive. Um, yes. I'll give out some of the titles people can check on before we sign out. Uh, Bleaching Beauty, Light Skin as a Filipina Ideal, uh, also Racism in the 21st Century, an Empirical Analysis of skin color, uh, the book that we spent more time on today, uh, an historical analysis of skin color discrimination in America, victimism among victim group populations. And uh, Dr. Hall, he has other works as well, essays, lots of constructive info. Uh, hopefully we can have you back on the program again real soon, Dr. Hall. My pleasure. Thank you so much, and we appreciate you being patient with the technical issues uh, and no listeners problem. as well. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening, sir. All right, take care. Yes, sir. Good. Context of white supremacy, uh, we'll take a quick commercial break, uh, and then if any of the folks that dialed in, if they have questions or comments that they would like to get in, uh, we'll address that um, quick commercial. And before I get to the commercial, uh, I think we'll get in a Richard, uh, Richard Pryor clip. I'm a big fan of Richard Pryor. I think he touches on exactly what Dr. Hall and the female caller who talked about uh, immigrants, African immigrants distancing themselves from black people. I think Dr. Hall said one of the first things that immigrants learn when they come to this area of the world, distance yourself from black people. You do not want anything to do with dark people. Uh, Richard Pryor, and then we'll go to the commercial context of white supremacy. I'd take him home, but I have a dog. <laughs> got all the Vietnamese in the, in the army camps and shit, taking tests and stuff, learning how to say nigger. <laughs> so they can become good citizens. <laughs> right, they got classes, you know they have All right, let's try again, tropes. Nigga, nigga, nigga! Nigga, 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 nigga! Well, that's close. If you get your ass kicked, you know you made it. RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas to Europe to Australia to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past. It is our current reality. Be informed. Be globally informed. You should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com. RacismDaily.com RacismDaily.com Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? 
Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? At counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design that's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. At Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-732-8000. Six seven, or check us out online at trimultimedia.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Justice with the Cows Radio Program. If you want to learn about understand, and counter racism, white supremacy, be sure not to miss a cow's episode. We keep them jammed, packed with constructive information to sharpen your use of words to help eliminate the system of racism, white supremacy, ASAP. Also, for more information on racism, white supremacy, and to invest in my counter racist efforts, please visit my blog, justdojusticetoday.blogspot.com. You're just saying just buckets and buckets of words. Yo, this is Wade, one half of the Black Twins I want y'all to check something out Our latest project, Double Consciousness, the Mixed Message This will be dropping October 2nd, 2011 Featuring various audio from Umar Abdullah Johnson And Dr. Kambom, just to name a few You can download this at www.gagmusicroom.bandcamp.com And at stlouismixtapes.com That's stlmixtapes.com Replace white supremacy with justice now. This mixtape is only for victims of racism and white supremacy. Context of white supremacy. Um, Before I get to the news reports, I wanted to make sure that I shared um, the iTunes podcasts are available. Uh, You can access them if you go to iTunes and you go to the search bar. You can search Uh, Really, you can search in a myriad. You can put in white supremacy. You can search racism, uh, Dr. Welsing, Dr. Kanban, anything. Put that in and then just click on podcast. Once you uh, put the search, whatever, however you're going to search in the search bar, when you open up your iTunes, click enter. Uh, After it loads, uh, just look to the left. And when you go to uh, filter your search results, click podcast. Uh, Once you do that, when the screen comes up, you should see several of the cow's logos. Uh, Click on the cow's logo uh, that is listed under higher education. Cow's logo, higher education, that should have all of the current episodes. Uh, It doesn't have all of them, but it has all of the current episodes. Um, If you click the other 
Cal's icon. Uh, there's the other one has, I believe, uh, 400, the first 480 episodes. So if you want to get older episodes, uh, download, listen online, you can click the uh, separate Cal's icon. I uh, should have about 480 podcasts. If you want the current ones as they continue to roll, uh, click the icon that has uh, higher education. And I'm actually going to switch the logo uh, for the podcast so it'll be easy to identify uh, the current, the one that has the current episodes. If you want to catch anything current, the stuff that just happened, uh, the broadcast yesterday with Pam or this past Sunday with Dorothy Roberts, um, click the cows icon under higher education. And actually, you could just search Dorothy Roberts. If you go to iTunes, search for Dorothy Roberts, click on podcast, and it should pop up. You should, you should see the cows logo. But the programs are still there. Uh, just there's so many broadcasts at this point. I think we burned through uh, all of the space. Uh, for the one feed, so we had to start a different feed, but uh, they are still there. They're still on iTunes. You can download them, listen to them online. Still available via iTunes. All right, doing a news report, and we will be back tomorrow. Uh, we have uh, Julie Landsman, suspected racist. Uh, she was also recommended by a longtime listener and investor. This is a white woman who has worked uh, as a teacher for many years, and she writes about working against racism uh, in the classroom as a white woman. Uh, same program time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on Thursday, October 20th. Uh, Dr. Anthony Browder, uh, he'll be with us this Sunday. Uh, that will be Sunday, October 23rd. Uh, Umar Abdullah Johnson, he'll be with us next Tuesday, October 25th. Full slate, I believe this is broadcast uh, 490 moving rapidly to 500, hopefully the return of Dr. Cambon for that 500th broadcast. Uh, moving to news items, um, I saw this before the program, and then someone shared it as we were rolling uh, during the program. Uh, Hallie's ex allegedly called her a ghetto nigger. I saw this on a couple sites, but I'm reading from yourblackwoman.blogspot.com. Again, your black woman. Dot blogspot dot com. Halle Berry is in court having yet another battle with her ex-husband, Gabrielle Aubrey, suspected white supremacist. In the center of the fight is their three-year-old da daughter, Nala. A judge refused Aubrey's request to end a requirement that a nanny be present when he has custody of Nala in Europe. Aubrey is taking care of Nala in Spain while Barry is filming Cloud Atlas in Majorca. Aubrey is only allowed three hours alone with his daughter and can take her to the park or shopping. The nanny must always be present when he does so. But Aubrey argues that the nanny is getting in the way of his relationship with his child. Barry is allowed to see her daughter for as long as she wants without supervision. Barry and Aubrey ended their relationship in 2010 after five years together. Aubrey has been accused of being neglectful and verbally abusive of his daughter, according to Barry and her witnesses. The situation went to a head when Barry returned home from a trip in February 2010 and found Aubrey in her home. She asked him to leave and threatened to call the police. The witness says that Aubrey then called Barry a ghetto nigger and threw a chair against the wall. Another friend of Hallie's said that Aubrey had a problem with Aubrey's mixed race, claiming that he never wanted her hair to be braided and always said that Nala was white. Barry got angry with Aubrey when he was spotted at a Lakers game with Kim Kardashian. She didn't want Aubrey to be anywhere near the reality TV cameras, but Aubrey says that no cameras were present. Uh, end of the report. Uh, and this was just posted today. It's again on yourblackwoman.com. Uh, doing a two-for-one uh, second news report. This also was shared with me by a listener a little bit earlier. Uh, today, uh, and I thought this is a pattern. It reminded me, uh, one of our investors had told me about this, really standard trifling racist behavior. Uh, this report is uh, from Yahoo. 
title is This Guy is Really Sorry for Slapping Devin Hester. Devin Hester is a black male. Uh, he's a football player for the Chicago Bears. Uh, the report reads, on Tuesday, we told you about a guy who slapped Chicago Bears kick returner Devin Hester in the back of the head in a Chicago area casino. At the time, we had no explanation for his actions. Now we do. Darlene Hill of Fox Chicago News caught up with the man, Danielle Rago, 52, and got his side of the story. Basically, his side is that he did something awful and he's really, really sorry. Here's what went down according to Rago. He was in line to cash his chips at the Rivers Casino in Des Plaines, Illinois. Devin Hester was in line with him, as was an elderly couple. A teller opened up a new window, and she waved Hester to cash in his chips. Hester moved towards the teller, but Rago felt the elderly couple was next in line. Here's what Rago did next in his own words. I went over to the left of him, and as a father would reprimand a kid, not saying he's a kid, but a young man, okay? And I just gave him a biff on the back of the head is what I did. All of that is in quotes. I'll read it one more time. I went over to the left of him, and as a father would reprimand a kid, not saying he's a kid, but a young man, okay? And I just gave him a biff on the neck, on the back of the head, is what I did. Then Rago, suspected white supremacist, apologized profusely, clearly embarrassed and ashamed about what he'd done. It's as sincere an apology as you'll ever see. If there's anything fake about it, this guy is the greatest actor on the planet. I was wrong for doing that. I mean, nothing justifies a person hitting or touching another person. It's wrong on my part. He's even offered to do what he can to make amends. Devin, if you're listening, called him by his first name. Devin, if you're listening and you can see me here, I'm telling you, I am so, so sorry. I made a mistake. I'm the bad guy here, and I apologize. I'm going to ask you right now. I will donate $500 to the charity of your choice and 20 hours of community service on your behalf. I messed up, and I apologize for that. Rago also wants to make sure everyone understands that Hester was just minding his own business. Devin, referenced him by his first name again, Devin did nothing wrong. He told me that the lady waved him in, so he did what he was instructed to do, okay? So no, Devin did nothing wrong. I'm the one that used poor judgment here. Devin's a good man, and I apologize to him and everybody else. By the end of it, I even started feeling bad for the guy. I guess you can watch his five-minute apology online if you're interested. Kudos again to Devin Hester for reacting with patience and restraint. I imagine that a stranger slapping the back of your head would be rather infuriating, especially when you didn't do anything wrong. The situation could have gotten much, much uglier if, heaven, if Hester wasn't a composed, cool-headed guy. As for Rango, it seems like he's learned his lesson, and if he follows through with the donation and community service, he will have turned a negative into a positive. Anyway, trifling antics of white people. I think uh, this is, I mean, there are many instances of white people uh, smacking other non-white people on the head, patting them on the head. They have George Bush photos, video of him doing this. Standard racist behavior uh, should not be that surprising to anyone. Uh, it, in fact, I would say the only thing you should pay attention to that non-white people referencing victims by their first name. Also, standard trifling behavior. Uh, just thinking of us as their children, cuffing a naughty child. How dare you step in front of these white people? Should let them go first. At any rate, um, 
a, a listener also, she mailed me uh, during the program. We had another John Brown reference, and she said that uh, there should be a sound effect for John Brown. If anyone has suggestions for a John Brown sound effect, I am all open. Uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but if you all can uh, can think of something, I'm game. I'll see if we can do it. Um, definitely should be something, because I think uh, he's been referenced so many times on the program by uh, white people and victims alike have referenced John Brown, and I, I really don't hear people saying anything uh, bad about him. It's generally to glorify and worship what he did uh, some, you know, 150 years ago. Um, so, yeah, if you can think of a sound effect to accompany John Brown, we'll see if we can get that up. Uh, I will double check if anybody uh, has anything they want to share uh, before we wrap up. I need to prep for tomorrow's program. Uh, if any of the folks that are on the Free HD line or the Talk Shoe line, if you have questions or comments you'd like to get in before we close out, uh, feel free. Uh, I think at least uh, 404 and the caller in D.C., your line should be open. If there's anything you want to share, uh, feel free. I will let uh, the listener, uh, David, get called in. You've called in repeatedly. Always good to hear from you, sir. Thank you, Facebook. Uh, asked me a message about contacting uh, Mike Henry. I've been very behind on a lot of my mail and messages, uh, just with a lot of programs, a lot of reading, a little bit behind. I definitely appreciate all of the feedback that I get from folks, and I try to respond as quickly as I can, but I'm a bit behind, so I have not spoke with Mr. Uh, Mike Henry, but I will be tr attempting to do so as soon as possible. Um, I will respond to all my messages. Just give me a little time. I get a little backlogged, a lot of messages from folks. I definitely appreciate it and will do my best to catch it up. Uh, did any of the folks uh, who dialed in, did they have anything they wanted to share before we get ready to close out? Yes. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. If you could speak up a little bit. Oh, okay. I do apologize. I turned on my phone. Is this any better? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad that you got him on there. And since you mentioned the situation with the Native Americans and what's going on with them, you haven't been able to get in contact with anyone in the Native American group that you can possibly get on the show to discuss from any one of the tribes. Did you ever make contact with the the, the information that I sent you for that Lakota? I have not. I forgot all about that. Thank you for. I told you all I get backlogged and <laughs> everything else. Thank you for reminding me. Um, yeah, I think that would be constructive. I will. Uh, I will attempt to follow up on that as soon as possible. I, I, I thought it was constructive then. It's just, uh, you know, things. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. But, yeah, I, I think that would be very constructive to get them on the program. Yeah, because I, I know you were in the process of changing platforms, so that's probably where it happened. Because I was reading some articles and on one of these sites that I, that I um, go on, one of these blog sites, and they were showing a picture of what a Native American looked like 100 plus years ago versus what they look like today. And of course, we know that the Europeans, when they, whenever there's a good thing, they always get in on it. And these people look as white as can be. Not one of them look as if they have any red or any brown in them. They are all completely white, white people with blonde hair, blue eyes, and they all claim to be Native Americans and collecting the welfare system that's being trickled out into the reservation. So once again, you're seeing where white people like you, like he mentioned with that case, that EEOC case in San Antonio, there it is, this white man complained, and he ended up getting the money and not the people who were being discriminated against, the dark-skinned Mexicans. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was, <laughs> I mean, as he said, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, but uh, a wh under white supremacy, a white person being the plaintiff, in a case where non-white people were being mistreated and the white person getting some sort of cash settlement, that is, that's a whole nother level of clowning that I hadn't even thought of before. <laughs> but that is what happened because that is the same thing that they're doing with these so-called Native Americans where they all classify themselves as being Native Americans. And black people now are being told that they have to get with all these different quantification of blood types and DNA and all of this nonsense to show if they have how much so-called Indian blood they have in them before they can even be put on the registry and white people just walk in there and say, oh, yeah, by the way, yeah, I'm a Native American and I'm white and I'm in. Mm -hmm. 
Actually, I'm remembering now that you reminded me, there's a professor. Uh, he's at uh, one of the University of Wisconsin sites. Uh, he's a so-called Native American, and he talks about this, the, the phenomenon of uh, white people passing as Native Americans so that they can get, you know, whatever, uh, financial gain or access to uh, scholarships or as some sort of benefit to them to pretend that they're Native American. And he talks about there's a long history of white people doing this. I suspect you'll see more of it if there's more to gain. Uh, he, he did a whole seminar at the White Privilege Conference uh, last April on this. And I got his card, had all this information to get him on the program and uh, just, you know, got I'm a victim, got backlog. But I, I talked to him after his seminar. I thought he would be great. And he said he was down to come on the program. If I have, still have his card, I'll see if I can get him to come on the program as well. Because uh, I think quite a few Native Americans are aware of this. Um, it actually would be interesting to hear him talk to both sides, black people being excluded and white people being able to come in and, you know, do whatever they want to, say they're Native American and get the benefits and still practice racism. That is quite true because even the current chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chad Smith, um, this man looks as white as can be. And I'm saying to myself, what, what is a native doing in the name of Chad Smith? And he's on the um, he's a Native American. You don't have a a, a regular Native Indigenous name. He's walking with Chad. Mm. Yep, yep. White people are. Uh... <laughs> They are slick. I think Josh Wickett, he said that there's probably going to be more of that white people pretending that they are non-white so that uh, people are not suspicious of them and so that they can, you know, say that they have uh, rights to affirmative action or if there are any benefits set aside for uh, so-called Native Americans or anything else for non-white people, they can get that too. Uh, they, they are real slick at that, and I think that would be super constructive uh, to get some Native American people to talk about that and the black aspect too, the anti. I think both of those uh, – it would be great if they could touch on both aspects. Oh, yeah, that's, that indeed would be um, great to have because we are seeing if black people were to ever get reparations, man, you would to see this one drop rule, they're going to have to get rid of it. Because we're going to see white people coming out of the woodwork seeing how many blacks they're going to trace their ancestry all the way back to the plantation to show that they have black in them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's white people writing... Uh, Books. I wanted to get them on the program. It's a white person that wrote a book about that. Uh, that they had a, they had, I believe, a white uh, relative that passed for black. I don't know how they were able to do this, but they were able to pull it off and pass for black. And they ended up getting an inheritance uh, somewhere along the line. You know, while they were passing for black. And uh, it, I'll, I'll get the information so I can share it, give you all the title and everything. But, I mean, yeah, I, I totally agree. If that ever comes down where black people do get any sort of reparations, you're going to see t Tim Timothy might even be in the group and, uh, saying, you, I mean, you talk about clowning. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully we can have this come up on a, on a future program. Okay, I'll let the other callers get it. <laughs> this is funny. But painful. Extremely. Extremely. Um, I don't know if the female uh, caller in D.C., her line was still open as well. Did you have anything you wanted to get in before we – she brought up the words. I thought that was super important. Did you have anything uh, you wanted to get in before we wrap up? Uh, groovy. Thank you for uh, listening in, and thank you for the question. Um, I would, and I think Dr. Hall, we touched on it at the very beginning, those words, integral aspect of how the anti-blackness and that pathology of non-white people mistreating other non-white people, especially black people and darker victims, uh, he, he touched on that words are an integral aspect of that process. My suggestion would be for us to be much more conscious, much more aware of the terms that we use and specifically terms that have any sort of negative connotation towards black people, darker people, and any sort of glorification of whiteness. Both of those should be totally eradicated, if not reversed completely, but certainly we should not be using terms like shady, 
uh, to imply that there's something wrong or suspicious about uh, someone fair. I have, you know, been yelling about that, Mr. Fuller. Uh, that term fair uh, should be totally eliminated. Just being conscious of the words that we use, and it's in all languages. I think he talked about in his book and on the program in Asian languages, uh, you see uh, fair and beauty as synonyms. You certainly see that in the English language, the French language. We had uh, our guest, uh, Christ, he was on the program, black male in the area of the world known as France. Uh, and he deconstructed the term bete noir, uh, meaning a uh, literal translation is black beast, uh, and how that is the equivalent of, uh, of a pet peeve, like something that annoys you. In France, they call that a bete noir, meaning black beast. All those terms and phrases, things that denigrate blackness uh, and worship and praise, glorify whiteness, all of that should be trashed. All of that leads to uh, the behavior of the victim Clarence Thomas, the behavior of the victim Ward Connolly. So a long list of that, but just terms that we use, and especially because most people don't think about that. I never thought about the implications of me saying fair, that meaning beauty, that meaning justice, uh, that meaning honesty, and it meaning white. I never thought about that until I began to seriously study white supremacy, and specifically, Mr. Fuller called me out about saying it. All of that should be taken into consideration. Try and nip that stuff in the bud as early as you possibly can with your children and not letting them use terms like that. Good hair. All of really being conscious about what you say would have, in my opinion, huge constructive impact on non-white people and eroding that anti-blackness. It would do it would do a great deal. And it would make you more conscious of the environment that, wow, we're in an environment that is just saturated with that sort of sentiment to degrade black people, darker people. You would really be because con- you're going to be seeing it, all, hearing it, seeing it all the time. So that would be my suggestion. And of course, that goes in line with those fairy tales. I think Dr. Layla Africa and many other people, it's like giving cyanide to your child. You really do not want them sitting down with the Disneys. Uh, I would even say the books, uh, the the Snow Whites and, and all of that stuff, Cinderella. You just don't want to give that stuff to your child. It has lifelong damaging effects. Uh, that stuff sets up a pattern of thinking about the world. We talked about it yesterday. That leads to those uh, incorrect uh, perceptions about what a man should be, about what a woman should be, about what we expect in terms of a sexual relationship. Just nothing constructive happens with those so-called fairy tales. If you want to white identify your child, set them down in front of Disney. Let them watch, you know, Snow White and Cinderella and all that craziness, Rapunzel. Let it ride. Just let them watch that all day long. And then go to school and don't talk to them about racism. You will have a white identified child who could end up marrying a white person or uh, wanting to use bleaching creams, being scared of being out in the sun too long. If that's what you want to continue to replicate, there you go. Um, We will definitely will be back tomorrow. White people permitting, we'll be back tomorrow. Hopefully we won't have the uh, tech issues. I think Dr. Hall was clear. I think it was just my end having some uh, internet difficulties. Hopefully that'll be cleaned up uh, tomorrow. Thank you all for being patient with that. Again, uh, the programs, they are available on iTunes. You can download. I know folks had asked about that. Current programs, they're there. Uh, Today's program, you might need to give it I don't know, a few hours or what have you, but the broadcast yesterday with Pam and all of the uh, earlier, more recent programs, they are on iTunes. You can search. You can find them. Uh, If you have any trouble with that, just let me know. You can shoot me an email or uh, message me on Facebook, but they are available, and uh, the feed should work as well. So you should have multiple ways of accessing archived programs. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, 404, for the suggestion. Uh, I will follow up, see if we can have uh, some Native American guests on the program. I think that would be super constructive. Should have done that already. Um, again, Dr. Anthony Browder this weekend, Umar Abdullah Johnson next Tuesday. Hopefully we'll have lots more constructive information. Uh, if you think the program is constructive, please invest uh, and make sure you visit Justice's website as well. Just do justice today dot blogspot dot com
justdojusticetoday.blogspot.com. Thank you all for listening in. Context of white supremacy signing out. Replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible. Thank you.